for almost all of the health benefits and the longevity benefits and the quality of life benefits. The amount of time you need to be training per week is measured in the one to three hour range. That's really all you need if you're pushing sufficiently hard. Probably the biggest return on investment the average person can make. If you do it properly, it can comport an unbelievable amount of benefits just across the board. So maybe we just start with kind of where you see the value of strength training. Do you think that there is a diminishing return at some point? Do you think that there is a diminishing return in the amount of muscle? I've said very tongue in cheek that the list of 90 year olds out there complaining that they uh, wishing they were not as strong and not as muscular is a very short list. Very short list. Right. So uh, but again, why am I saying that? I'm saying that to say that most people at the end of life are saying the exact opposite, right? Yes. I wish I was stronger. I wish I had more muscle. But from a practical standpoint, Mike, what, what is your view on muscularity and strength at the expense of what it might take to achieve them? Are there extremes that people should be mindful of? It's a great question. If you have to be mindful of extremes, in almost every case, you have already been on a multi-years long, very immersive, very infatuated, very disciplined journey of resistance training and focused nutrition. And the organization of many variables and parts of your life around that task, it's unlikely to be something you pick up a lifting hobby and just find yourself excessively muscular. So that's probably my best answer for that. It's just insanely unrealistic in most cases to wander into that sort of thing. You know, the, the, um, the myth of accidental muscle. Yes. Well, you know, people say more money, more problems. First of all, I met various philosophical grounds. I think that's absurd, but you don't accidentally become ultra wealthy and by God, I wish you the best. If that happens to you, I'll cry a tear for you, but in much the same way, almost nobody accidentally becomes hypermuscular to the extent that they're on that side of the spectrum, that trade-offs are starting to become apparent. Probably the biggest trade-off in the short to medium term is opportunity cost, things you could have spent doing outside of being in the gym. But the way that the science of resistance training works is for almost all of the health benefits and the longevity benefits and the quality of life benefits, the amount of time you need to be training per week is measured in the one to three hour range with three being like, you're really full sending it. One to three hours per week, if we took, if you went on chat GPT and did like a time use question, I mean like, can you list all of the things the typical American does for X number of hours a week and throw in, uh, you know, you just look, read down the list, top 100 time use cases, you may find that one to three hours a week is somewhere in like the 50 or 60 rank. And there's so many things people do that are way more than that. I mean, social media consumption, television watching, uh, and the list goes on. There are dozens of things you do that take way more time. And so if you really fully invest yourself, like I'm relatively fully invested into getting as jacked as possible, it's going to take some time. It's going to take, it could take eight hours a week, which is still like, well, it's not forever. You know, people will jog for 40 minutes every morning and think nothing of it. And then when you present to them the idea of resistance training, they're like, well, now that's going to take some time. They're like, well, yes, actually it does not take nearly as much time because the intensity of the effort is so grotesquely high and the recovery demands are so high that you have to be very pulsatile with it. It's not even something you have to do every day. As a matter of fact, people get incredible benefits. Probably the biggest return on investment the average person can make is to train for roughly half an hour, two times a week, Monday and Thursday. If you do it properly, it can comport an unbelievable amount of benefits just across the board. And so for most people, the consideration that they can begin to do this excessively is just not something realistic until and unless they're really into it, like a huge hobby. Like if you are watching Formula One for 30 minutes a day, every other day on your phone, realistic considerations of this is taking up too much of your time kind of out the window. Now, if you start like, canceling podcast guests because you're following the circuit around the world and staying in five-star hotels and booking the the hyper rich guy suite for all the races yeah like someone could say well you're really into this you're like no nonsense it's only costing me three million a year so then yes but it's it's obvious when you're going to be so involved uh, you don't just walk into that sort of thing so let's unpack this a little bit because well there's there's actually two things i want to go into but one of them i think will be a better entry into it which is 
you talked about how, boy, if you were going to put eight hours a week into your strength training, you're kind of at the upper limits of what a person might do. Conversely, if your goal is to be a really good endurance athlete, you're not getting, you're not at that level yet if you're only putting in eight hours a week, right? A, a world-class cyclist is, I mean, God, they're probably on their bike 30 hours a week. Something like that. Easily. Full-time right? job. Now, of course, not all of that is at maximum intensity. A lot of that, in fact, probably 70 to 80% of it, it also varies a little bit by gender, but let's just say 70 to 80% of that time is going to be at zone two. And they're really only burning matches in 20% of the time. Yet there's something very different about strength training, which is, are you really getting benefit at the equivalent of whatever we would call zone two in the gym? Like if you're at that far of a sub-maximal effort, what is the training stimulus? And is this just where the comparison between cardiopulmonary training, where there's a clear benefit from sub-maximal efforts and strength training don't uh, jive? That's definitely the case. Strength training I like to use the term resistance training. It's the general term for going into the gym and Makes applying sense. things to your muscles. Right. Because that th that's why, you know, you would say hypertrophy and strength are outputs of resistance Correct. training. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So you can get some benefits from very submaximal efforts, but resistance training is based on applying high forces and high levels of fatigue as its primary modality of how it makes you better. And so it's kind of when you get into that world, that's what's going to happen. It's like if you um, if you're trying to be a special operator eventually, you know, a, a, a Navy SEAL type of person, but you don't like uh, the sound of gunfire freaks you out. You're kind of in the wrong place. <laughs> so we get almost all the benefits from pushing either very heavy loads or lighter loads, but very close to muscular failure, which people have described as unpleasant, uh, a burn in the muscle, um, a lot of pain. Uh, the weights slow down, so it takes a lot of psychological effort to keep going. There is not really an equivalent of just getting on the bike and putting in the miles. Getting to a pace where zone two, you can breathe, you can talk a little bit still. Yep. That's not weight training. But precisely because weight training is so intensive, you need lots of recovery time between sessions, and you can do lots of disruption and damage in each session. And also, the total yield and how much it changes your physiology is very high for each session, and actually per unit time. And that means if you're not working super hard for any one unit time, you're going to need a lot of work. That's endurance training. If you're working insanely hard per unit time, you won't need a lot of work, nor can you recover from that much work, which is why the top end is eight or 10 hours or something for even professional bodybuilders of time spent in the gym every week. But for people that just want the basic benefits, yeah, we're talking about an hour or two hours a week. That's really all you need. If you're pushing sufficiently hard, that's both all you need. And realistically, like you can recover from more if you make time in your schedule and really prioritize recovery. But yeah, any much more than that gets to be like, oh, wow, I'm kind of sore and tired a lot more. And Mike, do you think this is a consequence of the fact that endurance training relies more on type one muscle fibers and strength and hypertrophy training are more dependent on the actions of type two fibers? Is that why? I mean, I, I I don't know why philosophically, I just think this is such an interesting contrast to make of how optimization of one is a totally different philosophy than optimization of the other. And the only reason I'm harping on it is I just know that when you take people who are very used to doing endurance training, it's a hard switch for them to adopt what you just said in the gym sometimes. Sure. It's, it's not the way they're wired. But do, do you think it's, is the best way to explain to that person the why that like, that's the difference between a type one and a type two fiber? That is probably the core difference. I would say there are two other things that mm. can be put into that equation. One is the physical forces are just much higher in magnitude. You know, you're going to be putting a lot of tension through your connective tissues and through your muscles when you're resistance training than you are when you're doing like bicycle work, for example. And so with high absolute forces, the proximate damage and disruption to the body is graded exponentially and not linearly. It's like if you, uh, if a wiffle ball flies past you, you might not even hear it. If a 50 caliber bullet flies past you, it's gonna tear parts of you off and it's never even touched you. Very, very different amount of damage from much, much higher forces. And the other one is some combination of neural and psychological drive. The kind of drive it requires to be good at endurance, at least the base building part, the aerobic base work that you do, is kind of being in a state of calm equanimity. You get your flow going, you get your music going, you get your breathing going, you look at the road ahead of you and you can just crank. But in lifting, you have to turn up the juice 
to really feel the, the maximum kind of situation. Uh, when you're pushing your body really hard and the weights are slowing down and there's sets of five or sets of eight or sets of 10, your body is very close to its limits. So both uh, your faster twitch muscle fibers, which are, are required, they take way more damage. They're also not as well proliferated with blood supply and they heal faster, or sorry, they heal slower. And the amount of absolute force is higher and the amount of neural drive it takes. Like you can hop on a bike for an hour at zone two every day. And afterwards, people are like, are you tired? And you're like, a little bit. I kind of feel like a little, also a little bit refreshed in a yeah. sense. You don't really feel refreshed after like grinding the leg press for five sets of 15. You feel like someone beat the crap out of you and you don't owe anyone money. What the hell is going on? So that intensity, that absolute intensity of lifting and high relative intensity, that's what tends to make the big, big fatigue cost.